You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between. Between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. <laughs> everybody and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, with me your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. Now before we get into this episode, I would just like to say to, you know, all of the people who have issues with language and my language specifically, this is not your history class. There are a bunch of other history podcasts which have a lot, you know, neater language than mine. And if you don't like words like piss a fuck or bollocks, probably best you bugger off now, right? Because this is just how it is. You don't like it. That is up to you. For everyone else, hey, did you miss me? I know it's been so long since the last episode. What happened? I went to Kansas. Well, I actually went to New Jersey first and a wonderful history teacher took me down to the the boardwalk. So I actually met a professor and then a teacher. So I, <laughs> because my fans are history people, which is super fun. So <laughs> uh, professionals. So I went down to the Jersey boardwalk and it was really nice. I don't get why everybody was complaining so much. I was getting messages going, careful that Jersey, it's a shithole. And I'm like going along the boardwalk, there's like vintage stores and ice cream and hot dogs that I never got to eat, but I want to go back to New Jersey to get some Nathan's hot dogs and I don't care. I want to do it. It looks like delicious. But I'm like looking at all this like architecture and you know, people are skateboarding and it's just very chill. I don't know, it was very nice. I quite liked it. It was quite a good time. And I don't know how else to expe- explain sort of like New York and New Jersey, like the suburbs versus the cities. And all I can say is it was very much what I expected it to be. I was really surprised when I got to Kansas though because it was bloody gorgeous. It was really, really nice. People are like, why'd you go to Kansas? It's beautiful there. You should all go to Kansas. Uh, If you haven't been to the Gaia retreat, it is so just beautiful there it was hot as fuck but but like uh we were taking like siestas in the middle of the day just because it was too hot like there was nap time uh so have lunch go for a nap that's how we worked it but i had such a wonderful time at the heartland pagan festival and i know it's current form is changing and i don't know what it's changing to but i would absolutely go again and I would, I would pay to stay in a cabin. I, I did get to stay in one as an honoured guest. Um, but I, I, I can't really do tents anymore because of my back problems. Because I've got scoliosis. And that just doesn't work for me as a general rule. And it was so much fun because uh, when we were we were there, um, I was sharing with the fawns. So they're two girls who they dress up as fawns. And they're, they're fabulous. So Kelly and Whitney. Oh, I had such a wonderful time. And... We just had the best time. But we were there one day and one of the girls in the in the kitchen was like, where's Emily? What's Emily like? And everyone's like, who the fuck is Emily? Like, who is this Emily person she keeps talking about? She thought my name was Emily. <laughs> so I ended 
So I ended up with this um, American persona called Emily. And Emily has vocal fry. And Emily pronounces words incorrectly. I mean, I know I pronounce words incorrectly because of my accent, but Emily loves these jalapenos and the tortillas. <laughs> like, Emily's so white. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm white, but like, Emily is so white. I had such, <laughs> I had such a good time. But honestly, Erin and Tara and Savannah, Amy and oh, Safety John and and Jeremy, Jeremy with the puppies. I just, oh, oh, it was so, <laughs> this one time at Pagan Camp, I cannot convey to you how much fun this was. I mean, I did see a lot of boobs <laughs> and a lot more genitalia than I was anticipating I would see. You know, because there are actually signs up in certain like areas going like, you know, you need to be dressed to be here. Like, you need to be clothed in order to be in this, like, location. But I had such a wonderful time and I I honestly would do so much to get back. I would, I would love to go back there just to holiday because it's just so wonderful. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking what your jibber-jabber in fact me. In fact you, I will. But first, we've got to get our source on. Mary Jane Kelly and the Victims of Jack the Ripper by Nell Shulden. The Hidden Lives of Jack the Ripper's Victims by Robert Hume. The Complete History of Jack the Ripper by Philip Sugden. Metropolitan Police 3-140. Police Investigation, Polly Nichols, Annie Chapman, Mary Jane Kelly. Metropolitan Police 3-141. The Norton Report into the Murders. Palace and Hovel, Phases of London Life by Daniel Joseph Corwin. When Prostitutes and Ordinary Citizens, Commercial Sex in London, 1885-1960 to by Julia Late. The Five by Halle Rubenhold. And of course we have The Echo, Police News, Pall Mall Gazette, Evening Star and The Telegraph. Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then let's begin. So this final episode in the five canonical victims of Jack the Ripper... So this is about Mary Jane Kelly and it's tough because she's known as the last canonical victim of Jack the Ripper. I don't think she is. And I have a special guest later on who's going to come and help me elaborate that. But that's the case. That being said, Mary Jane Kelly is probably the most elusive of every victim that we have dealt with thus far. Because we know Jack. We know absolutely nothing about her. Sorry, excuse the pun. But we don't. Every piece of information we have is definitely second, third hand. There are very few documents related to her existence. Very few indeed. And we're basically running off a rumour mill. It's whispers and hints and stories. There is very little concrete evidence which has led a lot of people to, you know, consider one option or the other and to assume that something happened one way or the other. And with Mary Jane, like her early life, we don't know. We don't know her date of birth. We don't know where she lived. We don't know how she was brought up. We don't know what type of family she had. Now, the story she tells, she tells different people different tales, as far as we know. Because again, we're getting it second, third hand, and a lot of this information is coming through, you know, interviews for paper or in the inquest after her death, you know, it's things like that. So she may have been born in Ireland and then moved to Wales. She may have been from Wales her whole life, like, we're not sure. There was a Mary Jane Kelly who was baptised in Limerick and whose family did emigrate now, this could have been another Mary Jane Kelly. It, this could very well be a case of mistaken identity, or not mistaken identity, stolen identity, identity theft. It could very well be. There's no guarantee one way or the other. But there are literally no Welsh census records pertaining to this. And if Mary Jane was who she said she was, she would show up in at least one census record. So she tells people that she was married to a coal miner called Davies or Davis, which is fairly common, 
decent Welsh name. There's no record of them. There's no record of their marriage. So if she was in a relationship with him, it was more like a common law thing as opposed to an actual marriage. But again, the census records, they don't show anything. We have nothing. And as a historian, may I tell you, this is incredibly frustrating because she was a person and her story deserves to be told. But we don't really know it. Maybe she didn't want anybody to know it and then, in which case, it's none of her bloody business, is it? Now, whether she was with Davies or wasn't with Davies, whether they split up or he died or whatever happened, because apparently it was like she was like 16, so she says, when she married him. And then after this, she ends up moving to London. Now, although our information is very much second, third hand, we can use this a wee bit to get a wee grasp of what Mary Jane was like. I mean... We know that probably her name wasn't Mary Jane and she probably didn't come from Ireland. So when she arrives in London in 1883, there are a few things that we get from her. She's well educated. She can read, she is articulate and she can draw. Now, she's noted as being a, you know, a good artist that she can draw quite well. Now, I mean, this could have been a talent that she picked up, you know, here and there. But in girls' schools, drawing was something that was, that was very much put forward. So if she was, you know, from a wealthier area and from a wealthy school, chances are she would have had art lessons. She would have had that. Because of the way that she talked about the places that she had lived, we can, we can surmise that she did live in Cardiff, before she lived in London. And she does tell uh, one of her lovers that, that she had a long stay in a hospital in Wales. Now, if she was in a public hospital, a public funded hospital, we would have a record of where she'd been, especially if she was under her, her own name, if Mary Jane was her name. But this isn't there. So either she was there under an assumed name, or there was the possibility she was put into a <clears throat> asylum. I know, terms. But that's kind of what happened when wealthier girls ended up in, you know, situations out of wedlock. So if she had been pregnant and given birth in one of these institutions, she very well could have been from an upper class family who had that. But the shame of that, for whatever reason, meant that she couldn't go back because of their particular perceptions on purity and womanhood and everything like that in the era, she would have been shamed. And so going back to her family may not have been an option for her. And so going to the place where there's a lot of people and a lot more opportunities, she ends up in London. Now, one thing people say about her is, apart from the fact that she's meant to be beautiful, she's quite young, so she's younger than everyone else we've dealt with so far, she's meant to be in her 20s. And she's got perhaps auburn hair. There is stories of it being dyed with henna, but we're not entirely sure about that. But she's pretty, she's young, and she doesn't really have an accent. Now, in order to not have an accent, that has to be, like, pushed out of you. You have to be trained not to have an accent. So, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but you get a lot of people who would be like, I don't really have an accent. Like, in Scotland for years, people would say, I didn't have an accent, but you hear it. And a good friend of mine actually commented on, on my voice the other day, and he was like, yeah, your accent just flipped in the middle of a conversation. I'm like, yeah, I, I do that. So sometimes it'll become more Scottish and sometimes it becomes a little bit more Irish, just depending on location and and what I'm talking about and everything. It's, I didn't realise I did it for so long, but I do it. But yeah, uh, so if, if she grew up in England and had elocution lessons, there was every possibility that she would you know, not have an accent. I'm not saying I had elocution lessons, by the way. I was just told to speak properly. <laughs> My gran, her family's from the Highlands and yeah, this is kind of how things end up. But yeah, with Mary Jane, 
she was, how would I put this? Well-spoken. And no one ever assumed she was any other nationality. And they wouldn't even consider it. Like, it wasn't a possibility to them until she told them. Like, she would tell people she was Irish. She was Welsh. But she didn't have an accent. Like, she didn't have anything, like, any lilts or anything that related to that. Uh, you'll see a lot of, like, movies and stuff that are in documentaries is when they, when they, you know, do portray her. They always give her this kind of fake Irish accent and it's always weird. But yeah, elocution is always one option, but there's always the possibility that because accents, especially in the UK, they're incredibly regional. So she could have just hidden it, disguised it. But again, she would need to be... I'm not saying she would need to be of a certain class to do that, but in order to pronounce things a certain way and not fall into certain colloquial habits, she would have to know how to do that. So there's always the possibility that she was from a wealthier family from a certain area and, you know, either couldn't go back or didn't want information to go back to them. But again, this is all guesswork because we don't know. What we do know is that she arrived in London in 1883. So she somehow gets a job, um, you know, as a high-end sex worker under a madam in London. And these aren't easy positions to get. Being, being a sex worker in these kind of areas up in like Haymarket and Piccadilly, Piccadilly, that's, that's a sauce, Piccadilly, she would really need to have something special or some kind of in. So her name even fluctuates a little bit here. So sometimes she's known as Mary Jane and sometimes Marie Jeanette. And it's quite possible she also spoke French, which you can learn, you know, in certain areas in life. But again, you know, French was, a, you know, an international language of, of commerce, of business, of dealings. So it was quite a common language for, again, wealthier girls to learn. So anyway, in the 1880s in London, these, these madams, they would be called procuresses. So it wasn't just come in, women lie on your back, you know, and out, and out, and set, remove, repeat, next person. It was kind of more like an escort service or, or even the girlfriend experience. Because a client, they wouldn't just purchase sex. That wasn't the point. You were supposed to buy a woman's company from the evening. So the women that were involved in this, the sex workers that were doing this, they had to be of a certain ilk. They had to be able to have a conversation. They had to be able to dance, which was incredibly important. You know, they had to know the lay of the land, make the appropriate, you know, comments, jokes, yada yada. And a lot of the time, certain areas would be booked out, like gentlemen would book like dance halls, like clubs would book, you know, these kind of areas and would have these kind of events so that they could spend an evening with the lady, adorn her with, you know, gifts and clothing and, you know, things that would make it not seem inappropriate to be together. Because if a gentleman were taking a lady out on a night in the town, you know, it would have to have the appearance of respectability. And Mary Kelly herself, she often referred to this as her career. Like, she saw sex work as a career. Whether she'd kind of leaned into its lot in life or whatever, that's what she did. She was generally comfortable at this point, so she would have jewels and clothing and she would be safe, you know, to a certain point. And again, it was relatively comfortable as far as the situation goes. And although she wasn't like a courtesan who would have, you know, very select, like one or two clients, she probably had a few repeat customers and that built a level of trust and a level of intimacy. Now, she ends up leaving her madam's house, the brothel, whatever you want to call it, and she ends up leaving. Now, 
she does say that she goes to Paris, didn't like it and comes back. We don't know if this is correct. We don't know if she actually went to France. We don't know what happened there or why she left. There's, you know, theories that she was trafficked. There's theories that uh, she went there with a gentleman who promised her the world and Mary Jane Kelly's personality just made that dissolve. So there's the the concept which did happen, you know, well-to-do escorts, sex workers, they were trafficked to France because English ladies were fun. It was a fad. It was, you know, the trendy thing. And so they would be taken and, you know, it, it would not be as pleasant a scenario as they had had before. I'm not saying the scenario before was pleasant by any means, but this was worse because, again, language barriers, unfamiliar locations, culture, etc. But then there's always the possibility that she went there with a man named, was it Craig? Craig? This dude, anyway. She goes over and, you know, she gambled, she was loud, she had no secrets, and he was more reserved. And so, although life in Paris should be kind of fun, especially for her in that era because of of what Paris was then, you know, it was the place to be. I mean, it's still relatively the place to be, but it was just a very exciting, you know, place at that time. But for whatever reason, goes to France, comes back from France, and she doesn't go back to her original madam. We don't know why, where bridges burned, was, did an incident occur? We don't know exactly why she left. Was the madam the very reason she was trafficked? Was the madam mad that she had left to, you know, start her life with this man and thus leaving her, you know, her clients without one of their favourite pets? Whom's to say, yes, I know what I just said, but I am thinking of other perspectives and even though it makes my skin crawl. So, for whatever reason, Mary Jane Kelly is now in Ratcliffe. So the Ratcliffe Highway, it's in London, it's near the harbour, it's pretty busy, it's pretty crowded, there's always sailors and drunks and, you know, it's easy to hide there, but also it's pretty easy to earn there. At the very least, she'd always have a full belly and, you know, a good drink. Now, it's at this point that we know Mary Kelly was drinking, whether she was drinking before and that had caused issues with her previous, you know, brothel. Again, just a possibility. But there she is, she's in the Ratcliffe Highway and she ends up renting this little brick cottage from this Dutch couple in like 1885. I say cottage, she basically rented a room in this brick house, right? And the owners, the original owner, her husband, used to rent out to ladies of the night, you know, to use for their clientele. And when he died, you know, the widow was like, eh, why, why ruin a good thing? May as well, you know, keep earning her money. Now, Elizabeth, who she rented from, she wasn't like a madam or a procure, sorry, a procuress. She wasn't any of these things, right? She was just a woman who rented some rooms. And it was whoever rented those rooms, it was up to them to find their own clientele. And so that's what Mary Jane did. It was easier for her. She could, you know, be more careful about who she was dealing with. And she was safe. Now, for the most part, you know, generally, Mary Jane Kelly was quiet and kind when sober. But when she had a drink in her, when she had alcohol, she was loud, raucous. Again, she held no secrets. She gambled. She she was not she was not great to be around, and she caused so much trouble that she you know she basically gets evicted from this room. And after this, she moves into the boarding house next door. Now, it's not that Mary Jane was you know drinking to excess all the time. It's just that when she did drink, she's generally what I like to refer to as a grumpy goose. 
I don't know if you've ever met a goose in real life, but A, they are terrifying and they, they will come at you. They will come at you when threatened. Even when not threatened, sometimes they just like to chase you. But yeah, once she's got a drink in her, she's an angry goose. She's honking. So a year later, she meets Joseph Fleming. He is this 27-year-old labourer and he is apparently heads over heels over Mary Jane. And, you know, she seemed to care for him. They actually stay in contact for the rest of her life. But, you know, their relationship doesn't last too long. She moves in with him, you know, not that long after meeting him. So, I mean, it's some kind of stability. Which makes sense because, you know, she's dealt with enough. And living with a man, as we know, as we've said before in many of these episodes, is the most secure option. So she even talks about how fond she is of him and she continues this for a long time. And so while she's living with him, she tries to quit, you know, sex work. She doesn't, you know, look for johns or clients. But for whatever reason, she's forced to, you know, go back into selling sex. Like she has to do it. Apparently it's the the only way of her earning. And the following year, she meets Joseph Barnett. Now, Joseph Barnett is one of our main sources of information about Mary Jane. Now, what she tells him and what she tells other people, it's information that we have to take with a pinch of salt. So she kind of settles down with Joseph number two and they're together and they, they move here and there over the course of a few months. But then they end up getting the little one room building in Miller's Court. And that's like the spring of 88. So, you know, it, from 87 to 88. And they move in. But what's really strange about this is that the tenancy is in Mary Jane Kelly's name, not Joseph's. Which, to be honest, is really fucking weird for the era because, you know, you would expect it to be in the man's name. But it was in Mary Jane's. We don't know why. We probably will never know why. But we do know that fact. So in Miller's court, Mary Jane would often talk to her neighbour. There was a young girl. And that's where we get another huge chunk of, you know, the information about her is what she tells this girl. And we hear about other girls coming up to her who are thinking about going into sex work. And she basically steers them away. She warns them against it, not because it's, you know, degrading or shameful or anything like that it's because it's exhausting like she said herself she was tired of it and again mary jane kelly is still very very young at this point so life with joseph barnett isn't all you know peaches and cream because he loses his job so he doesn't have an income and he can't get what he needs to get and so they're forced to rely on her going back to her career and engaging in sex work. Now, can you imagine, this is a woman who's already said she's tired of it. She doesn't want to do it anymore. She doesn't want to have to sell her body. And circumstances have forced this upon her again. Because think about it, she went from a situation where she was safe and secure and she was living with this man to just having to put herself in danger again because she would be very well aware of the risk because she is a woman in 1880s London who is also incredibly aware of the Ripper slayings, the Whitechapel murders. Like, she would have people tell her about them. And she was having to put herself in danger. Now, Barna also wasn't happy because Mary Jane was letting women stay in Miller's court. So instead of having them be out of the streets at night, she was letting people stay. Now, some people say that they were. But yeah, we don't have any definitive information on that. All we know is that she let women sleep in her house instead of having to be on the streets because she was afraid for them. So she was putting all this into play and then Barnett, he just can't be dealing with it. There's a fight. They were always having fights, especially when they drank and a window gets smashed. And the thing with this window is it gets like stuffed with like a rag or a cloth. It's just to keep 
the chill out because at this point it's not exactly the warmest time of year. But by offering her home to these women, she could very well have saved lives. Not just from, you know, the Whitechapel killer, but from the other dangers out on the streets. Yeah, Joseph wasn't super happy about this, but he couldn't really say anything because it was Mary Jane who had the roof over his head. She was paying for everything. It was in her name. But eventually it's too much for him and he leaves. But Joseph does pop back on November 8th, 1888. And she's chatting to her pal Lizzie. She'd been to the pub. She wasn't drunk. She wasn't like heavily intoxicated. She seemed very normal. And he says he came to tell her that he had nothing to offer her. He had, you know, no finances, no job, no nothing. And they talk for an hour and he leaves. And the next time anyone sees Mary Jane, it's her neighbour Mary Ann. And she sees her about quarter to midnight, 11.45. And she's going into her little apartment with a man. And she tells Mary Ann she's going to be singing. And she does sing. And they hear her singing for a bit. Now about one o'clock in the morning, one of the neighbours is complaining about the fact that she's still singing. And she's, she's at it for like an hour and a bit. And then by 2am... The dude is gone, rinse, lather, repeat, off he goes, and Mary Jane is out. Two o'clock in the morning, she's seen by a few people, and she then is maybe seen being spoken to by another man. At some point that evening, Mary Jane Kelly makes her way home. She goes into Mother's Court, she folds her clothes neatly, and she goes to bed fully in the belief that she's safe and sound because she's only worried about the Whitechapel killer and he killed people on the street so she had every reason to think she was going to wake up the next morning but she didn't and on November 9th about 11 o'clock in the morning the landlord sends one of his goons round to get the late rent from Mary Jane but when Thomas gets there and knocks on the door and gets no response, he decides to take a look in the window. And that's when he sees the horrific mutilation of Mary Jane. When it came time to bury Mary Jane Kelly, because it was assumed she was Irish, there was a Catholic ceremony. And like, like Catherine Eddowes before her, even though she had no family to speak of, or that we know of, like, people lined the street. It was a massive, massive deal. And we talk about the less dead a lot, but Mary Jane Kelly was a very, a very interesting figure for, for this because she was kind of venerated, you know? People had this strange obsession with her, possibly because of how little we know about her because so much of her is a mystery and that's where all these conspiracy theories come from. But because she was young and supposedly beautiful and because she had been mutilated in such a horrific manner and because she was killed indoors, she becomes this weird symbol, this icon uh, of this fallen woman. And it kind of instigated the need for change in a lot. And Mary Jane Kelly is laid to rest under a name she preferred to use. Marie Jeanette. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail now with one of my favourite history talk people and my special guest for this week's episode. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families past and present from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria, He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury 
to further his extreme love of opera, but this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. And now we have the host of the God's Favourites podcast and one of my first History Talk friends, actually, Melissa. Hi! I'm glad to be here because we're going to talk some true crime. So I get to get my true crime fix in now. So we started off on TikTok as friends just because I was like, oh, she's got a history podcast and I have one and we bonded over our love of, yeah, a lot of things, but specifically Jack the Ripper. And then we also have have a Titanic thing. It's at this point, it's my second profession is Titanic. I do nothing but Titanic content for the entire month of April. So that's where my brain is. So it's going to be nice to have a little bit of um, Jack the Ripper interlude here. We have very particular opinions about Mary Kelly. Indeed. So we we both know that Mary Jane Kelly is considered to be one of the what they call the canonical five. I love the term ripperologist. It's it's kind of funny to me. Ripperology. They they consider those five victims. Although I would say there are more than likely more than five. But you and I both think that Mary Jane Kelly is likely not part of that victimology, which is weird. I think for some people because they always consider her like the final death. I feel like either the ripper was somehow stopped before Mary Jane Kelly or just disappeared because this it's not it's not the same killer it's not I I don't care who it doesn't add up none of it makes sense yeah I think like when we both were talking about this previously we both had this it's it's clearly gut instinct because you know you can't prove anything with the river crimes but it doesn't feel like the same guy it just doesn't because when you look at the crime scene photos, and and please, if you're going to Google that, don't do it at work and, and just be prepared. Because Mary Jane Kelly's photos are terrifying. Um, that whole crime scene is terrifying. But when you really think about the condition of the bodies of the other victims, now granted, that was also escalating. Mm-hmm. But Mary Jane Kelly's death was so brutal and so violent that it just doesn't match with what... I think the Ripper was after, which there's also like the process killer who enjoys the process, but this is just a person he was trying to, you know, cut open and get organs out. And that was more of the MO with the other victims. Whereas Mary, Mary Jane was just uh, annihilated. And there's so much rage when you look at the others, they're so clean. They are displayed. Like they are out in the open. Every single one, you know, was out there. They wanted to be seen. And this is hidden away in a house. Yeah, and that's that's what always got me too, because he was so clearly proud of what he was doing, even when he got interrupted. And that's what we think happened with the double event is that potentially the first killing was interrupted or, or he ran after, mm-hmm. you know, the fourth victim. And he like an art project to him mm-hmm. more so than he I don't think he got thrills out of the actual killing. It was the results. Mm-hmm. Mary Jane Kelly was annihilated and mutilated and and her face was just gone Mm -hmm. like it was the most violent crime ever the arguments i've heard for her being canonical five is that well he just had more time but the thing is they were all public deaths not private Mm -hmm. this was hidden away and then mary there's we don't know that much about mary's early life or things about her doesn't make any sense that this is the same person i just don't i've never thought that And what I find really, I'm skipping forward a little bit, but there's a murder in New York of Carrie Brown and it happens in a hotel and it's very similar to the murder of Mary Jane Kelly in a room, very violent, very aggressive, it is of of a sex worker. You know, it's a very particular type of MO, whereas every single one of these ripper slayings, anyone that's official, air quotes, there's just a careful 
like particularness about it. There's something just very clean. Everything about it is putting it on display. When they, when they did it, they did it at night. They did it at a time where there wasn't really many people about, you know, walking the streets of Spitalfields or Whitechapel. Not at that time in the morning when there when these events would have happened. Between half one and three o'clock in the morning, which is roughly the sort of time frame when you look at it, nobody's around. You're lucky if the dock workers are even about. It's not as if he was going to get disturbed. It's not as if he was looking for somewhere to go away and do it. He always just kind of found the women in these. It always seems to be in nooks and crannies. And then very much puts them on display. Look at what I did. See what I have done. He would put their their personal effects beside the body. He would lift the skirt up so everyone could see what a good job he'd done. Like he's like you said, he's proud of this. Why would he then go and hide away and close the door? And those other killings were silent. Like nobody really heard anything. Because I'm I'm thinking, you know, possible strangulation, something along those lines. But with Mary Kelly, we have this like interesting timeline where she's seen walking off with somebody. And we know that her apartment, there was a coat hanging over a broken window, probably mm-hmm. the, providing an entryway. And people heard her screaming, mm-hmm. but they ignored it because they thought, you know, it's Whitechapel in the morning. It's, they just didn't, you know, mm-hmm. quiet, ignoring it, whatever. That is not somebody behaving quietly, be- mm-hmm. like bludgeoning a woman to death where she's screaming is not the same as strangling somebody and mm. pulling out their reproductive organs. It's just not the mm. same thing. So th- I'm I'm with you on the MO just does not match those other four killings. And I've always been bothered by this and I don't know why. It's not the scary. rage. It's, it's, it's the fact that there's clearly anger behind it. And that's what always kind of bothered me about this specifically is there's definitely, it feels more personal. Generally, when there's that amount of violent rage with something like this, it is a very personal, personal attack to stab that many times, to bludgeon that many times, like in the manner it happened. Like, you knew that person. You wanted to hurt them specifically. To me, that's and what it feels like. It kind of feels like that to me, too. And we do know that like Mary Kelly had a, had a, a person she was involved with. I won't say like a, a boyfriend, husband, but they lived together. They had relationships um, and she had been seen with him the night before and they were always fighting and gotten tr- kicked out for f- of a, a flat that they were sharing mm-hmm. together um, for like domestic violence and drinking. So he sees her the night before mm-hmm. she dies. And I'm always like, well, that feels kind of shady, but, you know, and then mm-hmm. also just the fact that she was also seen with a man who was finally dressed. There's, there's, there are so many contradictory mm-hmm. reports about what Mary Jane Kelly was doing at night and it just doesn't make any sense and i know that people think that this is just an escalation of behavior but it it's not escalation if the mode of killing mm-hmm. completely changes it's just different yeah it's and it's not a step up it's a complete shark jump escalating you you know it's the same but more it's like you see that with the rest of the killings it starts off with you know sliced open bits are pulled out And then it's sliced open, stabbed, more parts are pulled out, more personal effects are on display. Like it gets bigger, more grandiose, like every single time. But there's, again, it's display, it's his art. Here is the extra I've done. Learning and getting that little bit more confident every single time. Again, it's meticulous. So when it comes to Mary Jane Kelly, it just feels like such a, it just feels off. Which is very technical. (laughs) (laughs) So say there's no, the forensic evidence from this case has, you know, very much long been destroyed and it's impossible to track it down unless there's a confession letter that comes out at some point. But I I think about like the, the witnesses that were interviewed about her and how they talked about, she was with the man and then one guy, it was completely pitch black, but this man they were talking to gives this, he calls him Jewish uh, in appearance, which we all know that anti-Semitism was a big mm-hmm. problem in Whitechapel at this time. So that makes sense. But he also describes very, very strange, very particular things that it would have been, including like the like what was it, the color of his eyes or mm-hmm. the color of his eyelashes, and it was dark. Mm-hmm. It was pitch black. In the, like that, this the, is the, a smoggy London like back street. It's a dodgy old work cottage. You're not going to see those details. 
So that always roused my like, uh huh. Okay, where were you at when this happened? Because <laughs> he's he's one of the last people who saw her alive, and I'm like, um, mm -hmm. anybody look at this? I think his name was Hutchinson. He was like giving this very detailed description with you know these very small gas lights. How how are you going to see from about forty five feet away? Mm -hmm. Not to mention he was like waiting outside of a place for her for 45 minutes, which is also creepy. And he's describing down to the T what this person was wearing. One, why were you out there waiting on her too? It's it's too specific, you know, overkill on that one. There's just um, all of these extra details that nobody asked for. It's like, you know, when someone lies and they yeah. just, um, I know as a neurodivergent person, I have a habit of giving too many details, but that's a bit much even for someone like me. And the color of his eyelashes. And, and leaning into, because we all know the graffiti, um, whose body was that near? Um, one of the victims that said the Jewish sort of people, the men who will not be blamed for nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear if it was, you know, just already there. And it's misspelt or, as well, which is like yeah, somehow yes. worse, like the spelling is wrong. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I, I think it's supposed to be Jews, but it's J, I think it's J-E-W. Jewess. Yes. Jewess. Yes. Oh, that, that graffiti gets so much conspiracy theory talk going, like the masonry and all that jazz. But it's like, I'm thinking they're they're banking on the anti-Semitism to throw people off their trail is what it feels like to me. That is just, so that's just plain bigotry. Yeah, it is plain and simple. But like the fact that, that always alarmed me because he's, he sees her, she asks him for money. And he's like, nah, go on. And he weighs her off. But he waits outside for 45 minutes for her. Why? Why? Why are you waiting there? In the morning. So, I think six weeks or 12 weeks. She's like so many weeks behind on her rent. Yes. For the house. For the wee room that right. she's renting. Which is in her name. Not her like on-off partner. Is it James Barrett? Uh, Barnett? Is, hang on, let me Barnett, look. Barnett? James? Barnett? Yes, Barnett. Sorry. <laughs> look at that. Barnett. Uh, yeah. And he had been helping her out when he could. And but he had seen her the night before so that's the other thing i'm like so there's mm -hmm. there's two people who have seen this woman in the last 24 to 48 hours of her life and imagine knowing about where she lived and how the lock was broken and how she had to you know have a little bit of glass that she covered up with a coat like a curtain mm -hmm. and there's like like somehow they just get in there and go crazy and yeah. it's and it's loud and people hear it but they're not thinking anything of it because you know people are drunk in the middle of the night and why yeah, and if you're known for women, being like, it's yeah. just been thrown out of places for having domestic arguments, you know. Exactly, like, right. Like, there is that little bit of, oh, it's just them down the road. It's just them having another fight. It's another lover's quarrel. And it's like, oh, she's being dramatic. And especially there was, like, gangs and stuff going about at the same time. So some people would just not want to get involved in that. Yeah, and I think, you I mean, you're hearing people scream because there's a lot of crime and you, you're used to it. I don't think they're like... If it's only like a scream and you hear a thud and you're like, ah, oh, okay, whatever, and go back to sleep, they're not mm -hmm. thinking about it. They're not going to, that doesn't, like, I think of the roommate in this recent Idaho killing who didn't think anything was amiss when she heard a thud. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, it's a party house. Yeah. So people are now here all the time. It's kind of the same thing. Just mm -hmm. like they're they're hearing screams and everything constantly around the clock. And they, there wouldn't have been a reason to automatically assume that anything was amiss. Mm -hmm. In that regard, I know that's a lot of people are like, why did, why did nobody come help? Because that was just the East End. Yeah, the, <laughs> that that's just East background end. noise. That's the white noise they went to sleep with. Exactly. Oh, somebody's being punched and somebody's screaming. That is Whitechapel ASMR. Down in Miller's Court, like that's just how things were. I mean, when you think of who's all staying in those cottages and, you know, everything that's going on out with that, it's just noise. And then by what whatever stupid o'clock in the morning, you're going to have the warehouse workers and the dock workers bumbling about and going in anyway you're going to hear them going past like like you're going to have noise pretty consistently it's going to be you know a surprise for there not to be any kind of happenings happening I mean what you're used to and I mean I say that just like you know like I was talking about the roommate just when you're around those noises and like you're in a college town or you're in um, a bad part of town you're going to hear stuff and it's just like mind your business mm -hmm. or you know lock your door and don't pay any attention to it. Um, that's just the way you're taught to keep yourself safe. And just I'm gonna stay in my room. I'm not investigating. So there was no reason for them to think anything was amiss until they find mm -hmm. her the next morning. Yeah, it's very graphic discovery. Yeah, if anyone is gonna look up those crime scene photos, don't do it before bed either. Uh <laughs> yeah. Mary, you might Mary have nightmares. Days. You uh, um Mary Jane had no face. 
when this was over with. And I'm pretty sure now that having looked up these photos, I'm probably on some sort of government watch list at this point. I, I maintain I have I have somebody from the CIA and someone from like the MI5 just <laughs> watching me because some of my search history is... Oh, for sure. Uh, if my search history ever gets brought up for any reason, I'm a I'm a goner with some of the stuff I've looked up from history. But I remember the first time I saw this and I was in my 20s, I was nauseous. I was just about to throw up because I have never seen anything. And they're not even, this is bad in black and white. This mm -hmm. is bad in black and white, which tells you that's bad when you can see how bad it is in a black and white photo. Mm. I mean, blood soaked room. This was, it feels personal. And there's it just bits like of her are just hanging off. Like the way that her, I think, isn't it one of one of her joints is basically, like you it's just see. held down by like a sinew or a tendon or something. It's very, it's and you look very and aggressive. See the, yeah, very aggressive. And you can see the, the her eye sockets um, mm -hmm. with the skull. You, you're seeing her, her skull because her mm -hmm. face is gone. It's one of the most graphic things I've ever seen. But th to me, comparing that to anybody else, in this, you know, canonical five, the group, mm -hmm. nothing like that. It's not, a, he wasn't Jack the Smasher. He was Jack the Ripper. Yeah. And that always bothers me. And it's just because the other ones, he's not like destroying the face necessarily. Mm -hmm. He's not doing anything except, you know, disemboweling. It's um, the, throat, and, the throat gets sliced. Yeah, they like, they're, they're, they throw so it's quiet. And then he kills them quickly. It's not it's a practical. Yeah, it's a practical, you know, process of let's let me kill you as quickly as possible so I can do what I want to do, which is take out your uterus or whatever. Mm -hmm. and versus Mary Jane, who is slashed. Annihilated. Yeah, she's she just pummeled. Crushed. Makes zero like, sense. There's nothing smart about it. Like, and that's just like everything about it is so precise with all the other all the other victims. And this is just so much going on, which it's a juxtaposition to the rest yeah. of the killings. And you think about when they, they found Barnett, um, Joseph Barnett, her her mm -hmm. partner, he had to identify her body, but he could only do it by the eyes and the mm -hmm. ear. That's all he could do was say, yeah, that's her. And the those. color of her dyed hair. Yeah, she like yeah, put yeah, henna yeah, in it or something. Hair, so like. Red hair, I think. I think it's know, like she. I think there was something about her putting a, there was like a red hue to it. So she put like yes. a wash. So just to kind of make her seem more. Yeah. And he had to like, that was the only Thing he was able to identify her as because you can't the mutilation there was the most and most people are trying to say that's because he had the time he had time he's in a room where nobody is going to walk in and why wouldn't the mutilation be more careful yeah like if he had the time why would he not have very carefully dissected her yeah. entire body in a very careful fashion if, if why didn't he take his time if he had the time why this is clearly rushed because yes. there's no way you stab somebody slowly like that not with the manner in which her face her face is, is gone yeah, yeah that's gone. That always bothers me it's just gone there's and the no joy face. is just sort of hanging it's oh. it's it's one of the worst things i have ever seen now of course he is doing like all the things to the you know or like mm. the stabbing and, and the you know cutting her intestines but it's not the surgical precision we were getting accustomed to mm -hmm. in these and if mm -hmm. you have the time and that is your mo why isn't he just performing a surgery why isn't he just doing it with that time he has instead of unless she did something to make him angry or something but it's just very very unlike what we saw so i have always had this little gut instinct which i guess that's the terrible phrasing right now gut instinct but it's gut <laughs> instinct it was somebody else that it was not and it's it personal. Not. It's personal. Every single other one of the killings, they were just convenient more yes. than anything else. And this just feels like a very, very personal killing. I always think whoever came in came when she was asleep because her clothes are neatly folded, like right. on her wee thing. Or a medical examiner or somebody mm -hmm. who was like, this is not performed by somebody who had training. Yeah, this is not a, this is not a it's cut not. of by somebody who knows what they're doing. Right, like here's not. the thing, a butcher would have done a better job. Exactly. And he's like, yeah, it's not the same as the other cases where it was very surgical and anatomical. Mm -hmm. This was just hate. This was pure hate. And I don't know how somebody would escalate that far out of their normal MO of killing somebody. Just, again, to me, it's very similar to the murder of Carrie Brown. If you if you look it up, 
it's just she's in this hotel and she's just completely I mean it's not as aggressive as Mary Jane's was but I, I still have I always have the feeling that Mary Jane this is just my personal opinion that someone came in while she was sleeping and they were getting ready to like stab her anyway but she wakes up like that's my kind of theory and there's a little bit of a and this is what causes that little bit of a rage I say a little bit of a rage that massive rage is she wakes up and this person's like hell no stop 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 like yeah. no I mean these are hardy Victorian women like they, yeah. and this is someone back. who's known for this and if she Still had defensive help. wounds you wouldn't know by the time she was just smushed like oh. I don't she's yeah. practically liquefied in places you know so it it never made sense to me I know and I've I, every time I Number one, I, I will never think Jack the Ripper was a woman. I, I know that's a theory. I will never, because the strength to battle with these, because these women could have fought back against a mm-hmm. woman pretty easily. They're all very, like you said, hardy women. And she had held her own in fights with Barnet before. She had mm-hmm. been, many, many a quarrel. I, she, I'm with you. I think she was surprised. I think, you know, it was that she woke up maybe, or... And maybe something. she didn't wake up and the person was just full of rage anyway. But and, it was just yeah. such a particular. It's just there's so much anger behind it. it bothers me so and much. It bothers me too. And I, I love that we bonded over this because like, yeah, there's <laughs> the, the most frustrating thing about the Jack the Ripper case is that there is no way to know now. No. Um, too much time has passed. It will never be solved. I mean, I think they tried to say it was someone. Oh, given, they try and do it every few years. Oh, They're like, they oh, solved. it's Humphrey. Oh, it was Secret. Oh, I swear to God, if I had to hear me? another thing okay. about Sickert, yeah. I swear to God. I kind of enjoyed the Sickert stuff, but <laughs> I don't think it's him. But no, I think it's because I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then it was like, this is the reason why. And I went, oh, this makes sense from like a criminal criminological perspective. And I'm like, this is great. But then it became like, this is definitely the thing. And then this is because of this scarf. And then the DNA is rare, except it wasn't rare. And it's just it's not real. And it's also degraded. And Sickert just strikes me as like a, before the, he's a true crime fan before a true crime podcast existed and he's yeah. just like getting an outlet with his art. So I don't know. And th- that is the most frustrating thing that anybody who says they solved it is full of shit because we will never know who did it. Nobody we- has solved anything. We're never going to solve it. And like part of me just feels like like I go through this whole like period of where I go, I don't I don't give a I don't give a fuck. I don't I don't care who he is at this point. I don't care. Like, I just get these stages where I'm just like, oh. That's why like, when I did the series, I did a, a video on each woman because I'm like, look, we can talk about the suspects, but the mm-hmm. list of suspects is exponentially long. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's a billion conspiracy theories out there on who it was. But the fact is that he, whoever it was, if it was more than one person, who it, it was five women who mm-hmm. were just out and killed. And that's that's the story, not yeah. mysterious men with the hat. Yeah. And it's like, why Why does this one person matter more than the five lives exactly. or more that he snuffed out? That's why that book, the, the book five is so, the, yeah. the five is, yeah, because you're you're talking about their lives and who they were. And Mary, mm-hmm. Mary Kelly had this like fascinating background. I mean, we don't know a lot, everything about these women mm-hmm. just because of their record keeping and, you know, their personal life. And a lot of it is anecdotal, so we can't really verify how much of it is true. But mm-hmm. she's one who actually, she was like traveling around Europe. She, she... Mm-hmm. When she worked as a sex worker, she was actually like at one point a very, very high. Above yeah, the, it was very like, strange because she went from like this very high area and then ended up in spitalfields. The alcoholism and the addiction that was there also play a huge mm-hmm. part of it. And that's that whole concept of the less dead, as they call it, which is the when yes. you target people who are going to not be missed as much. It's what we see that today now with. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, sure. we still we see it everywhere. I mean, yeah. that's where I don't know if you ever listened to the podcast, The Fall Line. It's, I have heard it's good. I haven't listened to it though. It it is very good, and it's all to do with all of these people that have just basically fallen to the cracks in this in this area, and it's just one of those things that always. And you I'm more interested with, in those stories. And you see that with the like missing, murdered Indigenous women and two spirit mm. people in the United States and and Canada with the that that's those cases are not getting investigated the way they should. So that is a lot of what you see here with Mary Jane Kelly and these other and Annie Chapman, all these women. Mm. Because they they were considered less dead mm-hmm. because the, of what they did for a living or their situ- I know I know there's some questioning of whether or not they were all sex workers or if it was just like a casual sex worker mm-hmm. thing trading favors and it shouldn't matter it's just that somebody was going around and preying on women that they thought and they got away with it and that's the yeah. most infuriating part of the whole thing and while I, I I love listening to theories I think that that is the focus is that somebody just hated women. 
and yeah. that should be the focus and we should be honoring them. But that being said, some of the conspiracy theories are insane. <laughs> And I'm like, some of them, people, so one of them was like Queen Victoria did Queen it, and I'm Victoria's like, Victoria's grandson. Really? Oh, you know, dear the, but that was my the worst one was like people like Queen Victoria actually did it herself. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Queen Victoria she, wouldn't leave you're her trying house. to tell me her really? You, you think no. somebody wouldn't have noticed her walking down the street? Really? Oh yes. I mean, oh, Your Majesty. Let me just no. Th- I did love the um oh the movie um murder by decree with uh, christopher Plummer, where that's he's sherlock holmes and that's the theory that mm-hmm. they're running with the the mason the freemason stuff ah, yes. it's very entertaining um but that theory is so silly mm-hmm. it's me um number one she would you know deny 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 yeah. any sort of you know relationship between a, a sex worker and her grandson if that were the case and two it's just mm-hmm. the royals don't get their hands dirty we know better but also there's like the 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 H. H. Holmes theory of him being one of the most prolific serial killers in America and history, um, with his murder hotel. He's a fascinator too. There's a lot of rumors that it's him, but they have de- debunked that time and time again that yeah. he was not. So you keep seeing this come he up was and also I'm just a poisoner. Like, like it's this different MO as well. Like it's he's a different MO and he was not killing for pleasure. He was killing to sell the skeletons to make money. Mm-hmm. Terrifying that that was a thing in American history at all. But I mean, yeah. and it's just like, mm, let's dig up a grave or body snatching was a very lucrative business for H.H. H. Holmes, but he totally enjoyed the um, mm-hmm. torment. But I don't think it's the same thing at all. And you H.H. H. Holmes, it's like Chapman as well, like the Lambeth Poisoner. It's like, yeah, the Poisoner isn't about to go gutting people. At He's t- not a ripper. It's just not a ripper. It's not a ripper. <laughs> I'm glad we have bonded over that specific. <laughs> because i'm just like <laughs> i thought i was the only one who thought that and it's such a part of li- like mary jane kelly is such a part of ripper lore that some people are like hesitant to let it go but i'm like there's there, no. people get so mad about it when you challenge you know i hate yeah. i actually hate the term ripperologist so much because <laughs> because as someone who like when i was much younger when i was like a teenager i was like i wanted to be like a ripperologist because i loved like clearly i have issues because i have an obsession with historical true crime something's wrong in my noggin because i was just so into like ripperology i was into the everything about it was just fascinating again a lot of it is because it's unsolved you know and there's so many theories and there's so many options and you know all these other factors come into it and i was kind of obsessed i say kind of i was in fact obsessed my father bought me a book a case book of jack the ripper it had like photos inside a kid's book of jack the ripper No, no, no 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 my father bought me at 12 years old an adult book with pictures oh, of it was an adult book i thought somebody out there was making a children's book about <laughs> chuck the ripper i was like what is that could you imagine i just would like, that oh my god little ripper in white chapel <laughs> <laughs> it's like a golden book that would be <laughs> <laughs> this isn't oh, my knife god. it's too shiny <laughs> too shiny let me get it all bloody and all oh, those little like touch oh, books that you go in this isn't my knife <laughs> Not with it's the sound. too rough <laughs> I think we may be on to something. If it doesn't exist, we should write it. I mean, they have a We daughter. have come up with a great children's book. Let me tell you, Penguin Random House about they have it. A Donner, they have a Donner party, you know, full out cannibalism children's book. One of my mm. friends showed it to me and I was like, that's actually brilliant. <laughs> Donner party, they had to have a good time. Yeah. You know, I think that this is one of those things that all women get into, not because mm. of the violence toward the women, but because they're like, they, they're so obsessed with the story and like why i don't i don't even know exactly why but i feel like we all are like protective of these victims when we look back mm-hmm. at it now we're like the, you know with, the older we get the more we realize that that is the focus and not this yeah and we have given a moniker mm-hmm. he's got good branding and that's about but really other than that you know he may have still been operating somewhere else he may have done it but we we will never no and we'll never know like because violence against women then and who knows even now like it was never seen as a big deal so when he escalated to the point of of the first canonical victim we have no idea who came before right like the worst thing is about the ripper slayings is that they're not even they weren't even the only ones happening in london at the time you had the torso murders you had the west ham vanishings you know you had all of these different like killers running at the same time like the current place where scotland yard is now they found a torso there like it's an Which, unsolved yeah, and you can see it on the jack the ripper walking tour <laughs> thank you right there, there and here was a body right there and uh, you parts know part, of you know, part of me felt like uh i should be ashamed of that but it was actually very interesting but yeah we walked right by the new scotland yard and mm-hmm. like, oh and there's a torso there oh 
wonderful thank you uh not related but <laughs> yeah so like there was like even then several killers were running at the same time it's not wasn't you you just had you know, better publicity and the penny so why the do, penny why do were. you think why do you think that jack is the one that everybody's focused on just the mist i don't i can't i could never really put a good answer to that myself it's a very strange thing i think any any sort of unsolved crime people obsess over because every everybody wants an answer like it's a it's a very human thing to want to resolve something to have the information to find out who did it and i think some people are just so determined to be the person who figures it out as well yeah a lot of men especially i've noticed oh it's always men (laughs) <laughs> they think they know they think they know and it would not hold up in a court mm. with what's the evidence. i mean the forensic evidence long gone a lot of it is you know no eyewitnesses there's no dna on bodies we're not mm-hmm. going to be exhuming any of these victims and i'd say most of them weren't even very well preserved in terms of being you know yeah uh, preserved the funeral director because we you're not going to see that you're just not going to see that this time they would have been buried their mm-hmm. forensic evidence is gone you cannot prove this and it's fine to theorize but a lot of times it just gets to the point where people are so passionate that they're correct that it makes me crazy i'm like you're not we don't know we will just never know but that's not the point yeah and then you've got the people who refuse to hear anything out with their their belief system at all huh i wonder what that sounds like but you know, they're just so, they're just so, it's like a horse with the blinkers on. They're staring down this road. They're not seeing anything either side. It doesn't matter what's coming in. There's no peripheral there. And they're just so determined. There seems and, to be a personality type where they're like, my theory is right. And they stay so gung-ho to that theory that that becomes their personality. Like the Kaminsky people with the shawl. And I'm like, oh, God. you mean there was DNA on the shawl of a sex worker? We'll all be damned. Oh, what? What? <laughs> really? <laughs> Oh it's my like, god. Oh, kill her. Yeah, no, it's just uh I find that reprologists specifically do not care about the women. No, they don't. They don't care about it's like they don't care about what caused them to be there or why they were in there at the time and what led to their deaths. Or, you know, the fact that they were actual human beings with thoughts and emotions and families and everything else that went with that. One of my favorite podcasts, I think you know this about me, is the last podcast on the left, and they did a fantastic Jack the Ripper series. And mm-hmm. I really appreciate it because it's one of the first time I've ever heard men doing this story where they, they acknowledge that this was the less dead in, in action mm-hmm. at that principle of they were sex workers, so people didn't care as much. But then they also focused a lot mm-hmm. of information coming about these women. And I mm-hmm. think that's the most important thing to do because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who did it. That guy's a piece of garbage. Um, it's that five women lost their well. Trash. Yeah, trash. Trash. Jack's trash. Um, Jack and- is trash. I'm putting that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Get a t- oh, like merch. Yes. Um, but him and then those five women lost their lives for no reason except for nasty, misogynistic douchebaggery. That's, that's what I'm... Douchebaggery. Um, and that's the saddest thing out of this whole thing. But yeah, as as for Mary Jane Kelly, I don't... I have a, I have thoughts on who it is, but I'm like, okay. I don't I'm convinced know. it had to be, I'm convinced it had to be the on, either the on-off partner or that creepy stalker dude. I'm I sorry, think, I, but it's just. I really think it's Hutchinson, but the, the boyfriend being around, the, the partner being around also had me like, he was around the day before she got killed. But she, they're just, yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just you saying, know, if you're waiting it's, 45 it's usually, minutes. Usually the boyfriend did it. And if it's not the boyfriend, the boyfriend did it. Or the stalker. creepy stalker. Who was waiting for her forty five minutes outside the bar? Like mm. I said, the ten bells just waiting. Like, just just hanging outside the ten oh. bells, just waiting. I just you saw know. her. And she, uh, waited outside for it and watched her walk off with somebody. Uh, why were you doing that? <laughs> what were you doing? I mean, it's it's Ugh. cold. It's a cold night. Why would you be standing out there, like watching freezing your balls off? What is that about? Watched her go home. He said, "With like, why are you following her home? What are you doing?" That that's the, the alarm bells for me in that case. That's but just... I lean towards Hutchinson. But like I say, we'll never know. And it's just an absolute abysmal loss of life for mm-hmm. literally no reason except for men, 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 Ugh. men. It's always men. men. It's always men. And no one will ever be able to convince me Jack the Ripper was a woman. <laughs> Nobody. I'm no. sorry. No. I mean, it doesn't. There's no way. no way, and it's always, and you know what the funny thing is, every every theory about it, it's just, it's all misogyny, 
even because like every concept of a woman doing it is like it was a medwife it was someone whose husband cheated on her it was oh, someone who could not have children it's like all of those are very misogynistic like reasons and i'm like that's yeah. generally not a reason that women would kill and women are usually more careful killers i like, think women I'd, are more likely to I'd be poisoners for you I would buy Queen Victoria before I would buy any of those other reasons. Everybody had syphilis back then. That was just the national pastime. Yeah, everybody like, had everyone had the pox and their brains were starting to rot because of it. Like yeah. it's like it's an actual thing. Look it up. Their brains were rotting. Just <laughs> Victorian brains. Victorian brains rotting away. But that's it's it's infuriating to me. And I felt like, yeah, I'm so glad we bonded over that because I felt like I was one of the few people in the world who was like, I don't know. Okay. Think- I'm I'm with you because I, I remember I posted a video about it and you were just like, Yes, in the comments. Yes, just yes. so many exclamation marks. I'm like, finally, <gasps> someone agrees with me. <laughs> just like it just felt so wrong. And just Mary Kelly gets so and she also gets the, uh, one of the she's one of the more romanticized of the five. Um, because mm-hmm. she's she's the star of all the conspiracy theories because she was very beautiful apparently and very just a more fitting victim so she gets put into these conspiracy well, she was the theories. youngest wasn't she she was the youngest and she was apparently she was... very i mean she was a high class sex worker you know mm-hmm. a higher level upper echelon sex worker in france for where she where she changed her name to marie Jeanette, which i was like okay uh, i you, mean i get it i, I get it i like it also oh, yes classy. she was very popular um, but then she had this fall from grace and now it's like, but because she's, because she's the more beautiful of all the victims mm-hmm. probably, and she, she's getting these judged by that. You see this romanticizing of her, putting her in the center of like, you know, you've seen the from hell movies, I'm sure. And she, she's I, all have, I have, and the even the writer of the books, sorry, even yeah, the no. writer of the book said that, you know, he wrote this to deal with the trauma of his own mother's murder, like, Ooh, that's a lot to unpack for him sorry yeah <laughs> i mean i get it like, like we don't have that much time to talk about this this is clear. Yeah. <laughs> have you have you tried therapy buddy <laughs> i love Alan Moore, but i'm like oh dear instead of maybe romanticizing the murder I, you of know, women have you considered therapy, therapy. <laughs> The answer is usually no, they haven't. But it's let me just let no. me just drag down the legacy of another woman, romanticize this beyond compare to to the point where she's clearly part of a conspiracy theory because there's no other reason mm-hmm. she would feel not like domestic violence or just sexual violence and sadism. It's just it's not as if this happened, you know, for literal centuries. I mean, obviously millennia, but like really, I mean, even like even when you got like the Yorkshire Ripper slayings and things oh like God. that, which happened and the blackout killer and it's consistent it's not as if it's stopped these crimes keep happening it's just tell as old as time and at the end of the day it's the women that's the story they had they lost their lives for literally no reason other than whatever pleasure because men wanted to hurt them yeah Yeah, they want to hurt them and they thought because of who they are but i think it's just important for history creators when we're talking about it not just and and ripperologists if they're listening listen to me if you Um, are listening and you aren't sending me death threats (laughs) yeah right if you're not gonna leave mean tiktok comments (laughs) oh i mean that's that should be the focus that should always be the focus Mm -hmm. for those five women and i was so grateful when that book came out the five that i I was like thank god because now that's what we should be focusing on yeah i'm always there was a turning point for me I don't know when it was and it was because I do follow a lot of a lot of historical true crime specifically I find it easier to digest in a way I think just because it is so far back and because history is kind of my thing Uh, it's very much we should always see crime as victim first like Mm -hmm. victim first perpetrator second although sometimes that's the same person the victim and the perpetrator are the same person which is another whole (laughs) thing to deal with Switch it around, role reversal. Which is, um, as I like to call it, women who poisoned their husbands at the turn of the century. <laughs> they tend to be both victims and perpetrators. Hmm. There's usually arsenic. a reason they gave him arsenic. Yeah, so it, that's that's the only thing I have ever taken away from this. Not that, because at the end of the day, it does not matter who Jack the Ripper was. He is pathetic and we should not, I think it's fine to theorize. I think it's fine, but that should never, never, never be the focus of this entire thing. Mm-hmm. The focus should and- be the women. And don't look up those pictures at work. Not we at work. Uh, not on a shared computer. Yeah. Um, not it's anywhere NSF. where you're being um surveyed in any way because that's no, not before bed. Um, Honestly. and just not in palm public transport where people can oh, see. Oh, don't do it. No. Nothing like that. No. No. Keep, <laughs> keep that to keep that oh to yourself. God. It's just like don't don't look at any 
any old time crime photos. Don't look at any of them at all. Ugh. Anywhere, no, private, <laughs> alone, preferably daylight. In, Just incognito mode. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> we should stop giving stop stop giving them ideas. <laughs> All right, it's probably should oh wrap my this God. up. Oh, All okay. right. Okay, that was fun. I think it was else? fun. That was fun. That was we fun. should do something like this again in the future when I'm slightly more. Oh, organized. call me when you do the Yorkshire Ripper. We'll do that. When you... <laughs> the Yorkshire Ripper, the Blackout Killer. I'll just start. I'll just start finding weird. Let me tell you about this crime. crime. I'll be like emailing you these now crimes. I'm going going... To look up the, we're, we're going to look up. I've been looking up the Carrie Brown because I, I wasn't familiar. To, I mean, I, I had heard about it, but I hadn't seen. Um, I just find the... it. It's more. Oh, it's pretty similar. Yeah, I think I think yeah, you're it's, right. it's it's closer to the Mary Jane Kelly sling than any of the Whitechapel. She's kind of positioned the same way, too, in terms of the head being to the side and body. Being, yeah, it's, it's yeah. Inter- that's interesting. Interesting. And um, it's very interesting to, uh, to, to say bar for a second. It's um they they kept calling the person that was in the room with her Frenchie, but Frenchie was a term for anybody foreign. It wasn't necessarily French. Could have been <laughs> Italian, could have been German, could have been Belgium, could have been Dutch. It doesn't matter. They were just Frenchie. Frenchie. And then when you think of not to talk about it again, but the concept of who who Jack the Ripper was, a lot mm-hmm. of the original theories they either revolve around misogyny or um just general xenophobia and anti semitism. Right. Because because when you re- think about Whitechapel was an area for immigrants, really, people just kind of yeah. ended up there. And that's where a lot of it, you know, Leather Apron became Jack the Ripper because of Spring Heel Jack by Charles Dickens. It's a whole thing. Penny I dreadfuls, damn it. I, lo- I love the story of Spring Hill Jack. <laughs> like random as a wing uh but that's too good but no and and you'll see that the the people who were pushing used like the anti-semitism and 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 xenophobia against people to accuse mm. them of it's just a hot because it's mess. the whole thing of like the whole concept of copy and paste comes from like they would literally cut bits of the newspaper stick it onto the new printer and, the, and they would just that's how they would reprint because you know like if you've got they didn't have you know, reporters in every area. It was generally like right. someone from the Times would come down, but you know they have their own bigotry and bias and prejudice. You know, and and that's very much seen in what was there. And a lot of the information we have is like from the Illustrated Police News, and that was just like let's draw pictures of what we think happened. It's a whole. Uh, it's just a whole mess, really. It's like my actual my actual area of specialties. That specialty is expertise. Jesus, I can't say words today. Is the rise of sensationalism and the use of print as propaganda in the late modern period? So, like yellow journalism is just the. So one, that's my, my jam. It's one of my passions, just because the fact that, and I, I talk about it a lot. In when I talk about the Titanic, because what happened after that was that Hearst. Mm. really had it out for Jay Bruce is may they were feuding I don't know what caused the feud I would love to know mm. but so he immediately like starts lambasting him and he's like he should be charged with murder like in cartoons mm. with Jay Bruce is may and I'm like Ch- bro Ch- that's not that's not journalism mm. chill chill so you see that so much it's kind of it's a uh, just like yeah. printing it and just like yeah. what we can okay like it's... oh I can just make this up yeah, basically, it was just consistently like like that kind of situation, and that's yeah. what I found really fascinating. Because like, and also, they would just reporters used to show up on crime scenes with the police. Yeah, and they would just be able to it's tell not- everything. So you would get all these details that you and wouldn't yeah, get yeah. in other places as well. Which is like, that's why it's so tempered and controlled now between, especially in the states, with you, law enforcement hires media liaisons mm-hmm. to deal with the press, and then they have these things that they're going to keep quiet. They're not going to let you get on scene. Yeah, because you, and, they want to solve the crime. Yeah. I mean, you'd hope. So, you hope they, they want to solve the crime. Yeah. <laughs> I hope they do too. But yeah, no, it's uh, the press has thankfully come a long way from that. But at the time, yeah, it was just you could just say what you wanted. Yeah, back then you could just you could just print whatever you wanted. It didn't matter. Nobody was going to call you on it. Buy a newspaper and just destroy your enemies. That's that's how that works, and that's how. That's it, even at the time, like if, when you go back to that sort of in the Victorian era, like some newspapers would run like three weeks and then just end. Like <clears throat> newspapers would exist for like a fortnight <laughs> and go away again, like a month sometimes. They would just come and go because people would just buy newspapers and then try sell them and then not sell them. Or, you know, it, things would just go awry. It was, oh, man, just, it's funny. 
it's just funny like they would just yeah. come and go so it some things just ne- wouldn't necessarily have to be correct anyway being a journalist now like and you know we have that whole se- different set of ethical guidelines now but mm-hmm. like sometimes I just get so I'm like how did they even get away with half the stuff they did <laughs> like it's just oh, oh man. there's just, just make up yeah some of the stuff you up read numbers, making up it's just they did what they wanted to and they could just mm-hmm. say I, I had a source and you didn't have to identify who the source was or you mm-hmm. you know you just literally lie and yeah, it was fun I have a source do you I am yes. the source. That's my source. <laughs> Hello. What have yeah. um, Kill him. <laughs> well, we're just like doing hand puppets now. We're just like, yeah. yes. <laughs> what, what do you think, Wackus Bonkus? You know, <laughs> kill him. Oh, no. Ah, yes, Nephilopagus. <laughs> That's Nephilopagus. But yeah, it's just the sensationalism of like the Victorian period and the, you know, Edwardian stuff. And it, like these eight from like the 1870s to the like 19. 19- 30s 40s 50s was just yeah i think once it, it hit, once it started hitting the 60s things started evening out yeah. a little bit but yeah. even then it was well you yeah. know the press is a good thing but i mean i could say that i say that as if the daily mail doesn't exist like you know? <laughs> listen we have fox here it's fine fox and friends the inquirer <laughs> no that's just uh anyway not the inquirer my grandmother used to keep those all piled up by the bed and I'm like, oh, okay. Or like the weekly world news with all the alien stories. That's good stuff. But yeah, alas, we shall never know who Jack the Ripper is, sadly. And so. I don't think it really matters who he was because he was just nope. a dick. Trash. Trash. Yeah, Jack trash. is trash. Buy those shirts on our merch. <laughs> Seriously, make, make that Get it on a sticker. Put it on your cup. <laughs> Jack the Ripper was trash. Yeah. I like it. All right, Katie. That was fun. All right. Um, All right. Thank you, Melissa, for joining me. You are so welcome. That was fun. We'll find something else. Just remember, Jack's trash. Jack is trash. All right. And I am going to end this now. Here we go. All right. Uh, that's my happy pigeon sound because I could not figure out how to do a sound effect. I, I just don't have any on me and I'm very tired because I'm editing this so late at night. And that was the wonderful Melissa Fair Lady from the God's Favourites podcast and on TikTok. If you're on History Talk, you know her. If you're not on History Talk, go watch her. That is your recommendation from me this week. Watch her TikToks and her Instagram and listen to her podcast. It's fantastic. So, what I am going to say though, before we end this episode, is I want to talk about one, apologise if the sound of quality is poor because this is my first time doing a two-person thing and trying to edit on my end, so... Mm-hmm. And secondly, although we don't know Mary Jane Kelly's, I don't know, history, her real life, her her real name, because all the clues point to the fact that we don't. However, we can at least take solace in the fact that whomever the Whitechapel killer was, whoever Jack may be, as someone called Jackass the Ripper. Here's the thing about Jackass the Ripper is that we don't know his real name. Whatever he was trying to do, whatever he was trying to prove, whatever innate hatred he had that he was trying to push out in the world, his name is not known. The man wielding the knife? We don't know who that is. And frankly, I think we shouldn't find out because... I don't think it matters. I don't think he deserves to have his name known, whether an infamy or not. And at the end of the day, whoever did kill Mary Jane and these other women, whether they were the same person, which I doubt, or multiple people, which I genuinely believe, then they are sad, pathetic men who hate women. And they are not worthy of our time. What is worthy of our time is learning the stories of people who suffered, who dealt with this, who had to live in these conditions. And they say history is repeating. You know, those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. And that's right. And we need to make sure we don't repeat it because people, society, everybody deserves better. The marginalised on the fringes of society, people who are pushed down, minorities, they deserve better. And if you don't believe that, you are part of the problem. 
Now go listen to Melissa and her amazing stuff. I'm going to go now because it's very late and I need to get to sleep because I need to edit this and it's so, so long. But I am going to say adios, au revoir, au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.